Uh, I'd like to start by asking a little bit about the work that you were doing um, in the even in the 1960s. Um, you are well known as a pioneer of new media, what people call new media. Um, what sort of things were you doing or thinking about in the 1960s that may have set you on a course to, to where you are now? Okay. Um, I'd say that uh, the thing which uh, concerned me primarily uh, from let's say the uh, the uh, onset of my um, sort of uh, artistic practice was the uh, relationship between uh, the viewer and the public and uh, I was uh, interested in uh, redefining uh, what that relationship could be uh, and um, so this in the 60s and 70s uh, led to a number of experiments uh, which uh, would come under the umbrella of um, I suppose happenings, performance art um, expanded cinema and also um, you could say public participation art and especially uh, I was especially interested in strategies whereby the, uh, the viewer uh, could become um, physically involved in right. the um, let's say in the artistic experience. Okay, they they sound like I mean nowadays I think for people looking at contemporary art they probably sound like ideas which have been very influential in the last few years. Yeah. Let alone in the nineteen sixties and seventies, yeah. it might be difficult for people to probably imagine or uh, sort of envisage participatory work at that time. Could yeah. you give us an example of the sort of projects that you were working on at that time that were ex you know, expanding certain mediums like cinema or involving um, audiences? Well, maybe one uh, sort of very clear example was uh, a project uh, I did, uh, w let's say, which was both a work of expanded cinema and audience participation was at the Experimental Film Festival in Knocker in Belgium. This was uh, in 1969, I think. And uh, it, uh, it was an experimental film festival, a very famous one. And uh, um, so the normal relationship for a public with uh, the cinema is that you sit in your seat and you gaze at a projection surface and you gaze through its uh, window into a space of representation and there is a big um, separation right or uh, there is a fundamental spatial um, separation between the space you are in as a seated uh, uh, member of the audience and uh, the space of representation uh, of the uh, of the film itself um, what we did in uh, Knocker is that we created a projection screen which was not on the wall, but was on the floor. And actually it was not just a flat screen, it was uh, an inflatable screen, like a big balloon, and a very big one. It was about uh, uh, 15 meters in diameter. And uh, a film was projected onto this from all sides. So basically the... Uh, the filmic material, the, the, the narrative space was being projected down onto this balloon. And then the audience was invited to jump into this uh, balloon. So in, in effect, the audience were physically jumping into the image. And uh, they were both uh, either, there was either those members of the audience who were actually in the image uh, or other people who were spectators, but they were seeing uh, a conjunction of both the, uh, the the space of representation of the movies and the real space of audience actually jumping around mm. in the image. And because it was a, a soft, inflatable structure, it also caused certain deformations of the image. So actually, audience interaction with the, with the image was also a, a physical if a transformation of the image. Okay? Um. Did anybody... Well, I'm interested in the type of language that people used at the time to describe or deal with these experiences. I mean, it, to me now it sounds immersive, 
which is a word that yeah. is used a lot for virtual sort of systems. Yeah. Uh, but how was that described at the time? What kind of ways did, did people sort of deal with it in language? I mean, a key word at that time was uh, pa- participation and the notion of a, of a pa- of an participatory art practice. Uh, but also other key words were um, happening um, right. and um, expanded cinema. And, uh, and I was using a, sp- a certain terminology too, which was uh, the notion of situation. In other words, uh, the art work was not an object. Mm. The art work was a situation. So was that conscious of things like fluxus and and those sorts of avant-gardist movements? Yeah. And uh, the phrase that I often use at that time was that uh, um, we we would give the title of the work and then we would say, this is nothing and separate the two words so this is no thing this is a situation of opportunity so that was the sort of subtext Mm. for each of these uh, events Wow, I I, I think nowadays it would be difficult for some people to to think of, for example, fluxus happenings and virtual practices, new media and computer art um, as having similar sort of uh, ancestors out of of that, uh, let's say uh, commitment to the notion of a uh, participatory art practice uh, one then starts looking for strategies in which this uh, can be articulated uh, and also it can be articulated in let's say complex ways I mean with something like the movie movie in Knocker it was very effective but in the end the level of participation or let's say the scope of participation was sort of limited to people jumping in and, and sort of using their bodies to just sort of basically jump around in the artwork um, and uh, with um, the uh, arrival of uh, let's say media technologies and especially uh, computational techniques uh, it was possible to uh, begin to articulate uh, this relationship between the viewer and the artwork in a more complex manner. When did you start working with computers? Um, I think the first experiments were done in the late 70s. Mm. Uh, the first installation was done in 83. Right. Uh, very, very crude computers at that time and very limited, uh, um, very limited, uh, let's say, uh, visualization capabilities so Mm. one of the first works I did was called uh, points of view and at that time uh, and I wanted to create a 3d world which the viewer could navigate already in 1983 you were thinking 3d Uh, but uh, the computer I was working with had very very severe constraints so it could only draw a hundred straight lines in black and white at quite low resolution, so a, as a as, as a kind of um, how do you say as a visual language, it was very very uh, um, uh, constrained, mm. so that one was forced to uh, work in a in a in a in an almost constructivist uh, um, style. Uh, but at that time, I, I, I sort of found a solution uh, that helped me a lot because I started to work with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs and uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs are are visually very simple so they're easy to construct as 3D objects yeah right but at the same time they have meaning that they have semantic properties and you can you can offer uh, a dictionary to the audience to the viewer Mm. which basically explains what each of these very simple characters represent so uh, in that way I was able to create a visual space which on the one hand was extremely uh, modest, extremely simple in terms of its, uh, of its uh, um, let's say, uh, visual properties, but at the same time had uh, quite uh, um, serious uh, semantic, let's say, um, um, 
framework and, and uh, semantic implications. And also I was using sound at that time. And, uh, of course, uh, with soundtracks I could also add another layer of, uh, of, uh, of meaning. So that uh, actually this very, very simple graphic world carried some quite... Uh, a far-reaching conceptual uh, arguments. <laughs> wow. Um, that was the early 80s, yeah. and yet less than a decade later, you, were, you became founding director for ZKM, yeah. uh, which I think would be pr- certainly a, a legacy uh, that a lot of people would know. Yeah. Um, even now, ZKM remains a kind of pioneering institution, um, and yet... That's a long time ago. How did how did that happen? How did what was the context or the needs that the institution tried to yeah. to um, respond to at such an early time, okay. in 1991? Yeah. So um, I was invited uh, uh, in the very early days of uh, the ZKM. So the ZKM was founded in 1989, right? And uh, I joined it in 1991. Uh, and I was the founding director of what was the uh, then uh, identified as the Institute for Visual Media. So uh, ZKM actually had a very radical vision because it saw itself both as a uh, cultural institution that would uh, exhibit uh, artworks and also collect artworks, especially media artworks, but also would uh, carry out research in new media art practice and uh, also would produce new work. In other words, uh, I uh, launched an artist-in-residence program and uh, we were offering, uh, you could say, scholarships or grants to uh, professional artists to come there uh, and produce new work and uh, then have the work exhibited at the ZKM and many of these pieces were then purchased into the collection of the ZKM. Mm. Um, the the sort of uh, impetus for doing that at that time was a lot to do with um, the scarcity and the exoticism and the cost of uh, technological infrastructure. So especially when one was talking about uh, computer graphic systems, uh, which would give the artist, uh, especially artists who are interested in real-time graphics, uh, the power to do, let's say, complex works. Uh, this involved very expensive machinery. And it also involved um, a high level of technical comfort competence to uh, operate these machines. So uh, it, at that time, it struck me that what the ZKM could offer would be a kind of laboratory situation where uh, the institution itself would invest in this technological infrastructure Uh, There would be a team of uh, technicians that would be employed and artists could come there and basically uh, um, benefit from being able to uh, have access to these resources and also work with uh, engineers who could help them produce their work. Wow. Um, There's a lot of other questions I have about that, but I'm conscious of the time and the need to to really address what you're working on now. Okay. Um, uh, You've talked about resources, for example, in a situation like ZKM and bringing resources into the reach of uh, artists and and certainly younger artists. Uh, At the School of Creative Media, you also have some very high-end machinery. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what sort of resources you've got there um, that are being put into the hands of artists? Yeah. Well, uh, the School of Creative Media uh, is uh, a unique initiative in Hong Kong, probably in Asia, uh, and it really sets out to um, offer uh, students Uh, an undergraduate and graduate education in um, in the let's say the creative media fields uh, especially uh, digital media Um, and the school is fortunate enough to be in a position to be able to again provide a a number of very fundamental technical resources in this respect uh, and also a fantastic building uh, this new building which we um, was designed by Daniel Liebeskin. 
So uh, I would say our students are very fortunate because they have both a, an extraordinary environment in which to work mm. uh, and uh, a, an exceptional range of, uh, of uh, technical resources in which to exercise their uh, creativity. And also uh, because of my own, let's say, uh, history of research and development of, you could say, new technologies or new techniques of representation, uh, these are also uh, now uh, um, present in the school. Mm. Uh, for instance, what we have here at the, uh, at the booth here right. is an example of that. So students uh, not only have access to, you could say, the traditional uh, cutting-edge um, technologies, but they are also able to work with uh, very idiosyncratic technologies, very unique technologies, um, which um, I think are important because they're really tuned to what I think uh, belongs to the current um, um, sort of artistic discourse. In other words, these are specific tools developed to address certain uh, artistic and aesthetic challenges which are relevant mm. today. Right. And you mentioned the booth, which is sort of two booths down. Two booths down. Can you give us very sort of briefly uh, an, an introduction to that? What, what's going on there? We see people with iPads and, and black walls. So um, one of our research projects uh, derives from a partnership with the Dunhuang Academy in China. In China and the Friends of Dunhuang Academy here in Hong Kong. Uh, Dunhuang, of course, is this uh, extraordinary treasury of uh, over uh, 1,500 years of uh, Buddhist uh, cave painting. And uh, we are looking at uh, ways in which we can take the, uh, the digitized data which Dunhuang Academy is uh, creating, high-resolution photographs of the paintings, laser scans of the uh, cave uh, environment, uh, we're looking at ways in which we can create, you could say, virtual reality and augmented reality experiences for the general public. And uh, in our booth here, I think we have a very interesting experiment uh, using uh, augmented reality, basically uh, just using uh, a couple of iPads. But these iPads become magic windows that transform the booth into... Uh, uh, the representation of one of the caves at Dunhuang. And it's one-to-one -one scale in the sense that uh, if you move the iPad up to the surface of the booth wall, you're looking at the painting one-to-one -one scale uh, as you would see it in the cave. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, I've got people telling me that we are going to have to wrap it up. Um, but I hope to go back to the booth myself later well, and, and have another, uh, another try Great. at that. Thank you very much. This is Thank Professor you. Jeffrey Shaw from the School of Creative Media. Um, we will have more Gorilla Talkers throughout the afternoon until about 4.30. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Jeffrey.